How many times are you speaking with a photographer or you see out in the Facebook groups that there are photographers who simply do not know how to price their products or how to price things for their business? This is such a big big issue for photographers because we know if you price too high, people aren't going to hire you. If you price too low, you might have business, but you won't be making any money and you won't be profitable and you won't be able to be in business for a very long time. This is one of the biggest hurdles the photographers have to deal with. The thing is, is it doesn't have to be that hard. You just have to do a little bit of math. Eek, I know I said math. I hate it too. You just need to do a little bit of math and you need a little bit of help along the way. Well, if you have struggled with pricing, I am so glad that you are here today to join in the conversation with my guest, Chris Woolley. Chris Woolley, I feel is a gift to the photographic community and to the photographers who come in contact with him. He is one of the most generous people I've ever met in our community. Community, and he certainly knows his way around pricing. I am so glad you're here today to join us for this great conversation about pricing with my friend, Chris Woolley. Welcome to Focal Points, an end photo podcast hosted by Dory Howell. This is the place to be to learn how to build a photography business that you love. Hi, Dory. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Well, welcome to the Focal Points Podcast brought to you courtesy of Enphoto. I'm so glad that you are here with me today. Oh, me too. Me too. You know, Chris and I have been around the block a few times on the podcast circuit and, and the webinar circuit and that type of thing. So he was one of the first people that I called when I discovered that we were going to make, be making this podcast because I knew that he brings such great, incredible, actionable value to people's audiences. And Chris is a photographer out in Washington, Washington State. Now, not necessarily along the coast. Where are you exactly, Chris? I'm in Spokane, which is pretty close okay. to Idaho, as far away from the coast as you can get while still okay. being in Washington. Right. Very, very different sides of the state. And he and his wife, Rachel, run a portrait studio there. And as he likes to say, he specializes in making people look ridiculously good. And I can attest that I've seen his images that he does make them look ridiculously good. And he loves photography education. He educates people all over the place. He's very active in his local PPA chapter. And you can catch him on the circuit speaking in different conferences and that type of thing and always wearing a really snazzy bow tie. But he also is involved very active in his community musical theater scene in his hometown, and he enjoys a huckleberry milkshake. And dare I say, he even likes pineapple on his pizza. So it's true. I, <laughs> so I'm really glad to have Chris with us today. And I asked Chris specifically to come speak to everybody today about the topic of pricing. And we're going to try and keep things a little bit simple today, a really high level view of pricing for our businesses, the different options that you have. But I couldn't think of a better person to come and have this conversation with than Chris. So Chris, I'm just going to dive right in here. And I'm going to ask you, what are some of the things that people need to consider when they are setting their price lists for their business? Sure. So um, quite often we say, okay, I need to price things. And we've been doing it like, okay, I think I'm comfortable with this price point or this seems what uh, everybody else around here is doing. And so you're using external influences to come up with what your pricing should be. And that's a little bit backwards because everybody's situation is just a little bit different. Uh, maybe you have really high overhead or really low overhead, or you plan on having a ton of people come through, or maybe only doing one session per week. Uh, we've got a lot of different variables. So if we try to copy what our neighbors are doing with pricing, we're going to end up with something that's not very sustainable for our business. And instead, mm -hmm. I'd encourage you to look at your actual business and use that to determine what your pricing is going to be. Mm -hmm. So I've got kind of a, a little bit of a formula for coming up with that because everybody likes formulas, right? Oh, How yeah, do I figure out this. what my perfect pricing is? Um, so very first thing that you want to do is come up with what your desired salary is. How much money do you want to put in your own personal pocket? And this can be any number from, I just want to make a few bucks to pay for my camera addiction to I'm supporting my family and this is going to be our primary source of income. Everybody's mm -hmm. desired salary is going to be a little bit different. Uh, for the sake of illustration, I'm going to say $40,000 per year is what you might want to make. And we're just going to use that because the numbers work out pretty easy. So it's a little bit easier to talk about there. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to start with that desired salary, $40,000. And this would be pre-tax salary. So you you make this salary, but you still have to 
pay Uncle Sam his fair share. So just know that that all comes in. Correct. Play there too. are taxes. We, there are taxes, but unless I somebody knows to how to get out of those things, in which case oh, yeah. I'm listening. No. Yeah. Right. We, if you know how to get out of that, um, let me know. We'll have you on as a podcast guest. Um, So after we know what our desired salary is, uh, we want to then uh, multiply it either by three if you're a home-based studio or by four if you're a retail-based studio. And these are based off of uh, a benchmark study that the Professional Photographers of America did. Um, So for the sake of simplicity, we're going to go with a home-based studio being times three, meaning that your expenses are a little bit lower. We don't have that retail overhead. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go $40,000 times three because we're home studio. So that's $120,000 per year that we want to be generating from your photography business. So now let's break that down into a little bit more of a bite-sized number so that uh, we can actually start working with it. So we're going to divide that by 12 months, assuming that we're working all year round. Um, So if we take $120,000 divided by 12 is going to be $10,000 per month. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need to be bringing in in photography sales in order to hit that desired salary of $40,000. Let's break that down even more, though, so we can start to get more bite size. And let's divide that by about four weeks per uh, month. And I know that there are some months that uh, we have more than weeks on that one, but uh, we want to account for uh, vacation times and times that you have off. So uh, four puts us at working 48 weeks per year, which is a pretty manageable one, saying as there's 52 weeks. So we'll take that $10,000 per month that we need to be generating. We're going to divide it by four, and that comes out with $2,500 per week that we need to be doing in photography sales. Mm -hmm. So now we've got something that's a little bit more bite size with math that's uh, uh, backing that up. So we say if we want to make $40,000 per year, we have to be doing $2,500 per week in sales. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a pretty good number and say, okay, now I know how much I need to be achieving if I'm going to hit my own personal financial goals. Mm -hmm. Uh, That still requires a lot of savvy business, so you're not wasting money, not unnecessarily spending money, or buying the latest camera gear, things like that. This is just saying, if you've got a a well-tuned business, these numbers are going to work out, but at least gives us a starting point, and then we can kind of finesse from there as you start getting more experience. So now that we've got this $2,500 per week number, now we can start breaking that down and figuring out how many sessions do we actually want to be doing. Because $2,500 is a great number, but that can vary wildly. If we do one session per week, it's a $2,500 session. Mm -hmm. If we do two, $1,250 session. So Mm -hmm. $2,500 divided by two. If we're doing five sessions per week, so one per day, that's about $500 per session. 10 sessions is $250 each, and 100 sessions is $25. So we could be anywhere in there, right? (laughs) Yeah. Please, please, please don't make your business goal to be doing 100 sessions per week at $25. Well, actually, that can work if you're doing something that's high volume. Let's say you're doing like um, corporate headshots or we're going to be doing um, sports portraits and Mm -hmm. we've got in one day in maybe an hour, you're doing 100 different people coming through and each of them is paying you $25. That could work. And Mm -hmm. that could be a viable business model Mm -hmm. if you build your services around it. Now you're going to have almost no customer service when it comes to that. Like if you're spending more than five minutes per person on there, it's probably not going to be very profitable. Right. Um, So we want to try to determine where do we want to be at with that pricing formula. All of these numbers still work out to the $2,500 per week. We could do one session or 100 sessions Mm -hmm. and uh, we'll start to kind of dial in and focus in. But we want to figure out how many sessions do we want to be working and how are we going to hit our weekly goal, which helps us get our yearly goal uh, for making sure that you're actually putting money in your pocket. So those are kind of the the big considerations that we want to have. What format is going to work best for you? And one of the things that we're going to see there is that we've got different business models that can be working. Um, So we could be doing a very, very high volume, low dollar, like the sports type portraits or headshots, Mm -hmm. where we've got a whole bunch of people all at once. We're going through, we're doing it. We have a tier where we've got that mid volume, mid dollar. So that's going to be that five, $500 sessions or the 10, $250 sessions. Mm -hmm. Um, This is where a lot of people enter the field at and say, okay, I'm comfortable providing, say, a USB or digital download of all the images. I charge $250 for my session. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to be doing 10 of those in order to make your math work out, uh, which is a lot, a lot of work. So this is kind of the chaotic middle ground that I'd highly encourage you not to be part of Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a quick way to burn yourself out. 
um, unless you're very strategic about it. But uh, uh, that's also a viable way of making these numbers work. And then finally, we've got something that's a little bit more of uh, that personalized touch, that low volume, high dollar. So that mm -hmm. one or two sessions per week, they're going to be multi-thousand dollar sessions. That's really going to allow you to spend quality time with your clients, really develop that experience with them and make sure that they walk away with something that they're proud of. Um, right. And then we can start working on that volume because I'd love to be high dollar, high volume, right? <laughs> right. Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? But here's the thing that I think is really, really important to remember that right now that I'm seeing kind of as a trend in the industry and out in the socials that I read and, and look at is there's a really big trend that people want to see a certain level of a success. So they go out and they find someone who they think is they think because you never know for sure, you know, people aren't opening up their bank statements to show you when you hire them as a mentor or you buy their course or that type of thing. And they see someone who has a perceived amount of success. So they go out and they say, I need to do business just like them. And if I do business just like them, I will see the success just like them. And it doesn't matter whether it's camera skills, editing style, pricing or business model. You can't, or you, I shouldn't say you can't, you probably won't see the same success as someone else because they're bringing their own individuality into the mix. So when you're looking at pricing, when you're looking at what to offer, when you're looking at wanting to be high volume, medium volume, low volume, and set your prices, the best indicator of how to do that and what to do what is best for you is to determine what your personal goals are and make your decisions best on those goals, not what you see someone else 100%. doing. For me, a high volume $25 per session, I would rather rip my eyes out than have that type <laughs> of volume and workflow. Um, I'm not, first of all, I'm not that organized. You have to be extremely organized, extremely st strategic have really good workflows for that to make sense. And some people can really, really do that. I want to talk to my clients. I want to get to know them a little bit better. I want them to be fully comfortable in front of my camera. And I don't see how I would be able to do that in a really high volume situation. So that is not something that I'm necessarily interested in. But if that's what really appeals to you going into the schools and the sports teams, and the, and the conference headshot gigs and that type of thing, you can absolutely make it work as long as you dissect your numbers in a way that Chris indicated from starting at the top and filtering down and determining exactly where you need to go so that at the end of the year, you've made what you need to make to reach your personal goals. I, I absolutely agree. If it does not fit with your personality type, if you're yeah. the type of person that always has to go above and beyond and provide that amazing customer service, like you actually care about your clients, you've got that empathy, you've got that connection and that drive to, to be there and do better than what anybody else can do on there. You have to be able to budget that time to do those mm -hmm. things. If you're wanting to do that at a low price point, uh, you're going to have a really, really hard time and end up sacrificing your personal life or your sanity trying to, to make everything balance out. It'll just be a conflict of what your personality type is and the mm -hmm. business model. Yeah, it just, it just isn't going to work. And there's no, you know, there's no shame in wanting to be a high volume photographer, just like there's no shame in wanting to be a really low volume photographer. It's just really what works best for you. And your personality, because like, like Chris said, if you're constantly trying to work against that, you are not going to see, you're not going to have the passion to go out for those clients and really dig into your business the way that you should. But Chris, what I want to do is I want to ask you the most asked question of all time in photographers, newer photographers and older photographers alike. I would love to know your opinion on packages. Or a la carte. <laughs> uh, that that is a popular question, <laughs> and uh, th that's a big variable on uh, if which one's going to fit your business model the best. Like, which format do we want to go with uh, when it comes to it? And this will come down to what your business model is. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got uh, some um, big differences between doing something that's going to be package driven and something that's going to be a la carte driven, mm -hmm. and it's amount of time and simplicity that you need to put in there. Uh, the kind of general rule of thumb, if you're doing anything that deals with volume at all, 
um, where you won't have time to sit down with your clients and really guide them through it, packages are going to work out really, really well for you. They simplify the process. They make people feel normal. They can say, oh, I can go with that middle one. I want the number four, uh, whatever that case is. Packages mm -hmm. work really, really well for that if you're dealing with volume or you need simplicity in your pricing. Right. Um, so it, that's definitely a huge strength when it comes to that uh, uh, package format. However, yeah. if we switch over to a la carte, uh, that one has so many more opportunities for it, especially to get to those high dollar sales. You're not going to be limiting yourself. So with packages, we're going to come up and somebody may absolutely love all of your artwork, love everything that you're doing with them. And they're like, I, I am sold. Take my money. Uh, with packages, you can say, okay, yes, I'll take your top package. But if they still want to give you more money or they need something else, what are you going to do? Sell them that package again? Okay, mm -hmm. we'll do four top packages. Uh, <laughs> that's a really, really hard way. Like, well, I'm not sure I need that many prints or that right. many. Uh, I only have so much wall space that goes up there. I could go bigger on that print size, but the package only lets me do this. Mm -hmm. So it can be a bit limiting with it. With a la carte, you've got the ability to go through and uh, personalize the ordering experience. So your clients can get exactly what they need and nothing that they don't need. So mm -hmm. if they're all about that large piece of wall art that's going to be going up, you can say, hey, we can do that. Let's figure out the size that's going to be appropriate for your space. And you can sell them that size. It's going to be absolutely perfect. Or maybe they're a type of client that doesn't really want stuff up on their walls. You're like, no problem. We've got albums. We've got collections of different types. Uh, we've got things that you can display up here that are non-traditional um, display pieces. That's totally viable. And you can really quickly pivot what you're going to be selling your clients and personalizing that sales experience with an a la carte method. Now, the uh, downside to the, the a la carte is that it does require a little bit of salesmanship to go through. So you're going to have to guide the clients as they're deciding what they want to purchase. Uh, they can't just look at it and say, oh, package B looks really, really good and mm -hmm. have that be the decision making process. And now you pick out what items are going to go inside a package B. What's going to be your piece of wall art? What's going to be the gift print sort of thing? Um, with the uh, a la carte, you've got to kind of guide them through. Say, okay, we've got this large piece. Now, what do we need for sending to friends and family? What else do we want to have on the wall that's going to complete this wall grouping? Uh, what else are we going to do? So if you're not being a little bit more active in the sales process, um, it's going to be a big challenge and your sales are going to suffer from it. Um, so that one does require a little bit of practice. But uh, the nice thing is, is that you're not going to be limiting your sales in any way. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a, a third option that's out here, and uh, this is where we kind of combine the two of them with a create your own collection. Mm -hmm. And basically, this is kind of picking the best of both worlds. Um, so you're able to have a, a set format or guideline similar to what a package would be, meaning that we're going to have um, different elements. For me, I use a create your own collect collection method in my studio. So uh, we select three different things. We've got something that's going to go up on the wall, some piece of signature art. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some sort of collection like an album and we've got gift prints or smaller accessory type things so these are going to be our smaller prints or digital files or things like that and so um, basically what they do is it's uh, they select one thing from all three sections on there and when they do that they get special pricing if okay. they just want to purchase one thing um, and not get uh, say a collection of images but they just want the wall art and some smaller things mm -hmm. totally fine they're just paying the a la carte pricing Okay. Um, so what's nice is this kind of helps you through the sales process because it gives you a focus. Oh, we need to pick one thing from all three sections. That gives us a script to follow. So we don't have to worry about reading the client, understanding or knowing what to do with it. The downside to this format is that it's confusing like crazy. So yeah, you do this... have to explain it to the pro to the client and help them understand what the process is so they can get on board with it. Yeah. Some of uh, these. So what I have seen and kind of what I have done throughout my career is I've kind of gone from an a la carte, then I tried packages, then I didn't like packages, I went back to a la carte, and now I'm kind of in the middle of a create your own collection where it's it's more of the more they purchase, they, the discounts that they get. So if they only purchase uh -huh. one thing, they're only going to, you know, they're going to get that standalone pricing. But if they hit certain spending levels, then they give them certain discounts or added incentives to match the investment that they're making at this time. Pricing is one of those things where the best thing as far as what's best, Chris, you may disagree with me, but what I say is what is best for your business is what is most comfortable for you to explain and 
carry out with your clients. Some people like me didn't have a really good way of explaining packages and putting packages together that made sense. So I just said, forget it all. I'm going to do all of heart. But some people really can concisely explain their packages very clearly. They have a way of doing it and it, that's what works for them and their clients. So again, there's no real tried true rule of what is best out of all three of these options. It really is what is best for how you run your business, what you want to sell, your price points, how you put these things together and the whole bit. I wish there was a magic, like a magic solution to this question where we could <laughs> say, oh, yes, packages are best. Everyone must do packages or a la carte is best. Everyone must do that. But it really, again, comes down to what works best for your business. I think now, I a hundred percent agree with that. Like if you don't focus on what's going to be best for your business style and your personality style, you're going to be pulling your hair out wondering like, Oh, why isn't this working or getting super frustrated about things? Um, just yeah. like you, I'm constantly experimenting and seeing what works best just because I was doing something a year or two ago. Doesn't mean I'm doing it today right? because I'm wanting to, to hone and finesse what I'm doing, making it a better experience for my client, something that's a better business model for me and allows me to achieve my goals better. Right. And just like uh, you had said, if we're not doing things that kind of click with us or make sense with us or that we don't feel creepy or awkward or just kind of like, ah, about, uh, we're going to end up with a much better uh, business and our clients are going to feel better about us too. We're going to feel better about ourselves. So you have to do what's true with what your business and what your personality style is. Clients can tell when you are struggling to communicate something or if you don't fully 100% believe in what you're doing or any sort of just disconnect between your authenticness as a person and a business owner and what you're trying to sell and how you're priced. Clients can read through that. And all of those things, mm -hmm. as subtle as they may be, can impact the bottom line of your sales. But Chris, I don't want to keep you here all day because this is such great, fabulous information. But I was wondering if you could maybe give us three to four really great tips that you have for maximizing the effectiveness of price lists and the different types. That's another big, really big topic. So if you could just take a few minutes and kind of dive into that a little bit for us. Yeah. So um, when we're looking at uh, like the psychology of the price list, uh, this one's kind of exciting, uh, but uh, they, there's a few ju uh, universal truths, I guess, uh, as we're going through the different pricing models. Um, first off, when it comes to pricing, people want to feel normal with it. So they don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage of, and they don't want to feel like they're taking advantage of you either. Those are things that make people not feel good about themselves. And we want mm -hmm. people to feel good about this purchase. So whatever we do, we want to try to focus on making people feel normal inside of our price lists. And most people, like when we're looking at, say, like packages, or if we're looking at an a la carte price menu, we've got our really expensive stuff and our really inexpensive stuff. Nobody wants to come across as super, super cheap. Nobody wants to spend more than what they need to. So mm -hmm. we feel pretty comfortable in this middle realm that's on there. So when we're designing our price list, we want to make sure that we're really, really focusing on how to feel normal with it. How do we make them feel like they're okay with that? So really pumping up what your middle section is, uh, whether it's our package B uh, or if we have an A, B, and C package, or the middle of your a la carte pricing menu, uh, really focus and hone there. Most people are going to be most comfortable in that middle section. Mm -hmm. Embrace that. Really fill out those details and make sure that you've got profitable items in that middle section. Right. Um, <laughs> another thing that we can kind of look at is using price anchoring. And so this is basically a kind of a psychological hack, if we're going to use a kind of our buzzword type stuff, but ways of making people feel justified when they're looking at a price. And we've all experienced this. If we've gone to a restaurant and we see a, a chicken dish that's on the menu and it is $25, uh, we're trying to ask ourselves, is this a good deal or is this not a good deal? Mm -hmm. And we're not entirely sure on that. So we look at the other items that are on the menu. And if you see that uh, the chicken dish is $25, but there's a steak dish that's right next to it that's $75, that $25 feels really, really inexpensive. That's a bargain. And it feels like hey, that's a great deal. <laughs> uh, and that's just based on uh, our price anchoring that's there. Right. Um, very similar. If we see that a hamburger is only $12, that uh, $25 chicken dish seems pretty expensive then in comparison. 
Mm -hmm. The chicken dish might not have changed at all, but our relative information around it's going to help shaping us determine if this is a good deal or not good deal. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we can do is have what's known as an anchor on our pricing. And that basically says, throw out a big number right up top, right up in front, and that's going to help establish value for everything else. So this is where we can use our package A or kind of the Whopper principle, if you will, and say, we're going to put up something that's expensive. We may never even sell it, but it's going to help make everything else seem more affordable, more reasonable as we're going through. And that's going to make us feel better about what that pricing is because we're going to have a point of reference now. Uh, whereas if we just saw the uh, the pricing for that chicken dish or your 20 by 30 wall art or whatever it is, we might not know, is that expensive or is that mm -hmm. not expensive if we don't have something to anchor that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Other thing that we can do, and we kind of hit on this with the anchoring, but it's pricing high to low. And so that means that you're going to start out with your most expensive stuff at the top of the list and work down to least expensive. And the reason being that we can then start up with our anchoring up high. So the first thing they're going to see is that great big number. Mm -hmm. And then we slowly get more and more affordable that goes out. Right. And the reason that this works is kind of twofold. So we have our anchoring that comes through, but then we have the fear of missing out, FOMO. Mm -hmm. And so basically what's happening is we start at the top of that list and we say, okay, that's a pretty expensive one. I'm going to be at... Uh, say $2,000. I'm just making up numbers here. But if we see uh, something that's $2,000 for a print, okay, I can go down in size. And now I'm slowly starting to go down in size um, and down in what those price points are. But we eventually get to a point where we're saying, if I go down anymore, am I going to regret having something that's a lesser quality or is smaller in size? Am I going to miss out uh, by letting this great thing go away? And so we start to have this kind of psychological thing that's happening. It's like, we want to stay in this upper middle part of our pricing list because that's where the best value, we're not the most expensive item there, but we're still going to get something really, really cool and feel good about it. Mm -hmm. If we flip that and we start low and start working up uh, to the more expensive things, we've already established, okay, this is good that we're at this low point. And each step I go up, um, yes, I'm getting something that's better in quality, but I'm also getting a huge price tag that's going. And so we say, okay, this is a point that I'm ex I'm willing to accept that quality because I'm happy with the pricing. Mm -hmm. So that fear of missing out works to our advantage if we start high. Plus we have the anchoring. Like that's a win-win that comes through. Yeah. So those are the big, big ones. Yeah, there's it's kind of the idea if you're sitting in a selection appointment and you're showing wall art and you're displaying it on the screen, there's a an idea that if you start with, a, if you open it up and you're doing like a, a room view or something and you throw up, I don't know, a 60 by 100 in this room. And it looks shockingly big. Like no one would ever buy it that big. As you go down in sizes, it becomes, it becomes something they're like, oh yeah, they start to like settle down a little bit in their, you know, their heart's not beating and that type of thing. They <laughs> kind of get down to where it seems reasonable, quote unquote, reasonable for them. But if you start with a really small print on the wall and you go up in incremental sizes, then they're always going to, on those types of things, if you started with the big picture, they're always going to end up with a larger picture than if you started with the small picture of how people think about what is appropriate and, and that type of thing. It's always harder to climb up a hill than it is to slide down a hill. So that's kind of the way that I look at. I'm stealing at that. I like that, uh, <laughs> that phrasing. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if you can steal it, but I'll, I'll let you borrow it. But that's, okay. but okay. that's really is, you know, the view from the bottom is always emotionally harder to absorb, whether you're on a hike, whether you're looking at a price list or anything like that. It's a trudge uphill. But once you get to the top and you, you're you able to, to slide down, it's so much easier. And I find that, because I actually played with this in my sales appointments, that people who were, I presented the large numbers first and then went down a little bit, they seemed to be happier and getting what they wanted versus the ones who felt like it was a trudge up the hill to get to the level where they wanted to be. And that's just the way kind of how humans process these decisions in the sales session itself. So um, this has totally flown by. Um, Chris right. has so many, like we're done already, which is hard to believe. Chris has offered some really, really great, great tips and insight on how to price your um, products, not your products, but how to price your business. And um, if you want to know more from him, Chris, where can they find you? 
Yeah. So I've got my website, uh, cwoolly, C-W-O-O-L-E-Y.com. Mm-hmm. And that's where I've got uh, uh, listings of where I'll be on future like podcast episodes or different educational opportunities there. Yes. Okay. So cwoolly.com, right? Yep. Okay. Awesome. It's got a link to all my socials and everything on there too. Perfect. But if they, if they want to find you on Instagram, how do they do that? Yep. Uh, my personal one's at pinup Chris. Pinup Chris, right? Because yep. you are a pinup photographer. And if you've never seen any of Chris's beautiful award winning work, you need to go check out his work. He does a lot with um, just stylistic things and concept art that I think is really beautiful. And it's won him a lot of different awards. So I don't want to be remiss in mentioning that Chris is absolutely a beautifully accomplished photographer and just beautiful work in his studio um, with his wife, Rachel, alongside him, right? She's she's in the studio yep, now too, She's right? my other half. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Chris, I thank you so much for your time today. Um, I really, really appreciate you sharing your insight and we might just have to have you back for a part two very soon. So thank you so oh, very I'd much. I'd love that. Thanks, right. Story. Great. Now, before you go, wasn't that a great conversation? Chris is so great and so generous with all his information. We're going to have him back again soon. But before you leave, I just want to make sure and remind you to go to our show notes page at the focalpointspodcast.com. That's focalpointspodcast.com and get the download that Chris has created for us and for our community about pricing. Sometimes you can listen to it, but having it in front of you is something that is so very important. So you don't want to miss that download. And while you're there, sign up to get your 75% off sample from Enphoto on a great sample product that you can show your clients and you can use this pricing information to make sure you get the sales that you want. Thank you for joining us for the Focal Points Podcast and we will talk soon. Thank you for listening. This has been Focal Points, an Enphoto podcast hosted by Dory Howell. We hope you've enjoyed the show and we will see you next time.